So my job today is that they put me after lunch, well, so I have to wake you up. Uh, and I'm doing it with a process-oriented presentation. Challenge, I love a challenge. Okay, so might as well start it. Uh, I got a lot to talk about. Um, it's funny, I started off with 15 slides, and I think I have like 53 now, so. Um, so everyone here is for the stable real time. Not stable or real time, but the stable real time, or real time stable, whatever. Um, so for the uh, upstate, uh, <coughs> oh, I'm echoing this. Uh, so for the uh, upstream stable releases that you're all hopefully familiar with, um, Everyone, who's here not familiar with the stable, upstream, stable releases? Okay, yeah, 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 BS. So everyone knows about we have the stable releases. Uh, uh, just overview of exactly some of the process that's going to. So after like, you know, 3.14 is released, you'll have a 3, uh, uh, sorry, 4.14 is released. You have a 4.13 that gets, you know, stable releases for 13.1, 2, blah, 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 blah. When 4.15 RC1 is kind of released, the previous release, 4.13, is no longer supported, um, and 4.14 uh, is now the stable releases, so really it's just one, back one that we do the stable releases. This is the way we started. This is the way we liked it, but some people didn't think that was good enough, so we now have what was called the long-term stable releases, and every so often, you know, I think Greg has switched it to, was it once a year now he's gonna make one release, a real-time stable release or something. He's, before, he just randomly picked one, hoping that people wouldn't just bombard that one release with, uh, as we gotta get these features in, we gotta get these features in, whatever, so. But now he's saying, okay, that's, it's been better lately. He's kind of like controlled people, so. There's now, right now, to, as of um, today, well, actually, yeah, I see the, uh, 316 it shouldn't be up there, um, is it? No, yeah, it's still there. So 32, 316, 41, 44, 49, 414, they're all uh, projected end of lives are the, uh, those dates I have up there. Uh, so now with the real time stable releases. Uh, currently we have what we call a development branch, which is right now on 414. Uh, Sebastian, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name right now, it's just, uh, um, he works with Thomas Kleichner, and he maintains the uh, 414 development cycle. So all new, new code or anything that we need to fix or find problems with um, happens on the 414 release. And right now, it's been, when 414 came out, we kind of like started on that and been working on that for a couple years. And like, it usually could take maybe one, two, or three releases before we switch to the next uh, real-time kernel release to be the development branch because we want to make sure that um, we stabilize all the real-time development or you know, make sure that this kernel works for real-time and sometimes it takes a long time, it takes two or three releases um, to make sure that happens where it's good enough to pass off to the stable team. And uh, that's why you know, 4.16 will come out, it's going to be the new real-time. So 4.14 is pretty much stable at this moment. Uh, but until 4.16 comes out, Sebastian will still maintain it. Once 4.16 comes out, he's going to stop work on 4.14 and say, Steve, take it. And I will pull it into the stable tree at, at whatever he did is what I will start working with and work on it. So I will be working on the 4.14 once that happens. So again, this is about the stable release process, not about the uh, development process. As I mentioned, um, there's 414, that's how his last name is. Like I said, I can't pronounce it. Uh, so right now, we have the stable releases are 4.9 uh, maintained by Julia, 4.4 uh, maintained by uh, Daniel, wherever he is. 4.1 um, is Julia as well. And 3.18 is Tom Sanusi is uh, going to be maintaining that more as a um, uh, learning process because if you're on the 3.18 kernel, anyone here using a 3.18 kernel at all? How about 318RT kernel? You're using 318RT. We need to talk. <laughs> because really, I was told like it's done. Like We're not really helping out, so hopefully it still works. We would really highly recommend going beyond that, but yeah. Um, I still also do 3.2, but I don't do any backport patches of anything that Sebastian comes up with, because it's so far away that it really is almost meaningless 
to bring it all the way back to 3.2. So when 3.2 comes out with a new stable release, I'll check every so often and say, oh, 3.2 has updated the stable or has stable kernel, I'll, I'll forward port it or pull in the patches and all that. So keeping up with the mainline stable releases, so what do we do? Um, <clears throat> so each of the R team stable releases, if you notice, maps to one of the long-term stable releases. We don't usually care about the short terms, although the development process may work on the short terms and then go on and then switch up to the next one. But the stable releases, for the real-time stable releases, we don't care about the uh, interim in uh, kernels. We only care about the, uh, the, the long-term stable releases. And that's what we work on. And we usually say that we will maintain that real-time kernel for as long as it's maintained upstream, you know, so 318, 318 keeps going forward and forward. It's like the one that it never wants to end. Uh, but we said we're done with it. It's just too much time, too much time consuming. Um, but Tom, now you have a customer. Uh, so we should, technically we should really sync up with the stable releases twice a month because Greg Crow Hartman is a monster machine. He seems to pop out, um, uh, stable releases like a rabbit. Pops out, you know, baby rabbits. Um, but, you know, sometimes we're also working, we're busy, we don't always keep up with the stable RTs, but, so we try to be good and backport all that. <clears throat> so how do we do this when we have a new one? Uh, when we say we're going forward port to, like say uh, the stable releases have a lot of releases that are out there and we're like, we, you know, we've got to catch up. We have to, you know, pull in all the fixes that the stables have so the real-time kernel's not susceptible to all the vulnerabilities that the stable releases have already fixed. So we say, okay, it's time to think. Now the way I did it was I would increment each one. So if I was like four, five, six releases behind, I would merge in each one individually and label and increment the RT count each one, one, one. Um, when I do backports from uh, Sebastian's tree, which is basically, he'll find things like, oh crap, this is, this breaks real time and it affects all the stable, or it affects a stable tree. As all I'll do is affect one stable tree. I'll pull, we have to pull back those fixes as well. So every time we update with a stable, we try to increment it. So what I do is, you know, um, I'll do a git merge of 4951, update the local version RT. Everyone know about the local version RT or local version files? If you want to give a little extra tag, when you do like the U name of, a, of a, your U name dash R to see what kernel version you're using, you'll see like dash RT1. Well, that comes from a local version file. So if you have a local version file in your kernel, this is for anyone that you want to add an extension to make it special. To, so when you boot it, you can actually see it. This is a different kernel. Create a file called local version, all one word, and put something in it, and that will be appended to uh, the kernel version number. So if you didn't know about that, now you know. Uh, but so we use something called local version RT because it was kind of nice because these local version files uh, that the, when the make process pulls this in, it just searches for anything that starts with the letters local version. So we could put local version RT and, add it and update it. So I would uh, edit it, change it from RT40 to 41, commit A, you know, make a tag on it, you know, then go to the next release and so on and so forth. So when you look at that, if I do a git tag, I do grep 495, I see all my releases and you'll see it's, you know, 41, 42, 43, 44. And I haven't actually, this is, I was way behind and caught up by hitting every single one of these. Um, but it stopped happening. <laughs> and uh, so I looked at this and went, wait a minute, when I was writing these slides, I'm like, this doesn't work. Like, this, something happened, and I first blamed the wrong person, and then we had a really long discussion with the right person. So, um, what happened? Because when I first started doing this, I kind of did it this way, but then I was told, no, it's better to label everything, every single one of them. But Julia wasn't. <laughs> Hi, Julia. The, um, you know, she didn't know the rationale for why I was doing it or that, and actually, I had when she asked me about that, I, I couldn't even remember what the rationale was to tell her why we did it for each one. Why not just merge it in and set it? So I'm thinking, well, maybe we don't need to do this. So yesterday we had a real-time meeting, we had a discussion, and actually, there's actually a rationale to do it, but we don't, well, there's a compromise. We don't have to do it for every single release. So when you look at this, if you do an increment with the RT, like I said, it's not always, this could happen. So if I go back, if you notice that 
uh, it was 76. The next one was uh, you know, 4984. So to do this, you have to merge in. You, you start off with you know, get checkout 49RT, and it's currently at the 4976RT1. You do get merge of so the 84, and you get these conflicts. Now you got to go and look at the conflicts and work on, fix them, make sure they're right. Now to go back, and I looked at this, those are three conflicts that happened at three different stable releases. Um, but right now, we only see it at one. We only see it at that first, at the one with the RT base. So if something went wrong with that and we have to investigate it more, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out the conflicts when you're not at the place that introduced the conflict. So what we're planning on doing from now on, I believe we agreed that this makes sense, is instead, we could jump, we could skip, but if anything has a conflict, we need to tag it at that release. So we tag it once, resolve one conflict, go to the next one, resolve the next conflict, go to the next one, resolve the next conflict. So it makes it a little bit easier if something went wrong because when we're resolving conflicts, a lot of times it's just us doing it. So it's only Julia doing it, it's only myself doing it, only Tom doing it, uh, Dan Daniel. Um, so if we screw up, we may not know, it may work, we go run our tests and everything works, but then someone else goes out to the field and uses it and they say, wait, this thing broke and we got down to this conflict or it was this merge request. We want to really know exactly where it happened. So, that's, so we plan on tagging it where the conflicts happen. So if you see random spots, that's why. A conflict happened here, we tagged it, we fixed it, so now it's easier to find. Uh, one of the discussions came up was should we add it just a tag just before the conflict too? So that, that way you can see if it works, that works. Um, that's kind of up in the air. We may or may not. So that's not a requirement. We may do it. We may not. So going back to it, so what we plan on doing now is that each stable release, if, a if there's a conflict, we're going to tag it, or at least we'll do that in the future. So we do a git merge, 4978, solve the conflicts, git commit, increment the uh, local version file, go to the next one, git, solve the thing. When you catch up, to all this, because right now, when we even we do resolve conflicts, I don't know about how you do it. When I resolve conflicts on one, I basically, okay, resolved, I'll just compile the kernel, boot it, run a few simple tests. Basically, does it boot up? Does it run? Does it can handle some you know, priority inheritance work? Yes, it does. Okay, good enough, go to the next one. Um, and I don't spend too much time on it, because once I get to that final one where I catch up to mainline uh, stable, that's when I'm going to do all my tests, and my tests could take several hours, and I don't want to waste the time each time, because you know, this takes time, and we're not doing this full time, so this is kind of off, we have other jobs to do, so this is hopefully extra. So once you catch up to the final release that you're now equal to what's stable out there, although usually when I'm done with my test, Greg or Hartman put out another stable, and I usually curse them for that. <laughs> so <clears throat> we catch up. We run our tests. It passes. Great. You know, all our test passes is good. We're solid. So we need to make a release. Um, now we also have to make a, a tarball because, oh, actually, here's probably a good question to ask the audience. Um, who here has used the preempt RT patch? RT? Okay. Who does it from get only? Ooh. Who uses the tarballs or the patch cues? Okay, good. So it is, okay, so we'll continue this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when I first started doing this, uh, becoming, creating the stable RT patches, all I would do is just merge the stuff, and I used Git Cherry to create the patch quill, and got this little patch queue, and I kept pushing, I made my patch queue by using, you know, merge the stuff, use Git Cherry to give me all the changes that's different, and then make the queue, and blah, blah, blah. Well, people are telling me that these patches did not apply. It didn't work. Um, so I had this, uh, patch that I had to apply, that's from Sebastian. And for those that um, don't have good eyesight like myself, here's a little zoom in. So if you look at it, it did something simple. It just removed you know, a uh, function. And I, I don't know why exactly, oh yeah, it had some sort of issue, boom, blah, blah, blah. So he found out that this wasn't needed, we could just delete it for the real-time patch. I'm not going to go into the details of why this. So now you go to, the thing, the thing is, you go to the next release, and one of the stable releases modified that function. All it did was change the work queue to make it a little bit different. And next thing you know, you go to look at what was changed, 
And I just realized by looking at this, you know, Sebastian's the one that did this. Because this was before I went to real time, or went to the stable release. This is actually Sebastian's work. I'm wondering if it will still crash um, with this update. So maybe this isn't even needed. That's a good thing we should probably check out. Take a note. See, this is real time debugging while giving a presentation, because I just thought about that now. Anyway, you notice the uh, conflict right now with this. The fact that one changes, so if I try to apply the patch, I'm going to get this error. You know, hung, fail, blah, 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 blah. That's because it doesn't match. So you can't just do a cherry pick of all the patches that are different. You need to make a queue that's based off of the latest stable release. So once we got up to um, 4.9, like say 4.9.11 on this case, uh, if you look into the stable git tree, you'll notice that there's uh, a, git, a stable tree, but you also see a dash rebase tree. The stable tree numbers, where you see RT1, RT2, whatever, they never are rebased. So if you pull from it and develop on it, you don't need to worry about it breaking your code when you do the next pull. They never, they never rebase. We update them, and that's it. So we make a rebase branch because, as the name suggests, is we rebase it every time. So the rebase branch will always rebase, and we tag it with a rebase. The difference between the two branches, uh, if you do, if you notice git diff there, that actually if you do a git diff between the non-rebase and the rebase branch, they're identical. They are, there's nothing different of the code base. But how you got there are completely different. One is incremental. We applied a bunch of real-time patches, did a bunch of merges of stable, added some more real-time patches, did more merges, and so on and so forth. The rebase branch starts from um, <clears throat> the, the stable release, so 4.9.11 here, and it will actually have all the patches built on top of it. So when I make a quilt queue or whatever, I use the rebase branch to pull, I just say, give me all the changes from here to here, because I know they all will apply nicely for when you guys download the code. So a little RT overview. Now, RT is coming to mainline. It will be there shortly. <laughs> Everyone says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by latest 2020, hopefully by 2019, possibly by the end of this year. Um, depends on several factors that's beyond the scope of this talk. But this is very important because people are gonna to have to start understanding how RT sorta of works or a little bit of the concepts because when you are working on the kernel and you don't care about real time, if real time's in mainline, that means that you, if you break real time, you gotta change your code to fix it. Yes? Config time. You either enable it or you disable it. But it doesn't matter, you can have it disabled. And if you are developing a Linux kernel, you could break real time without ever turning it on, and we're going to hopefully have bots and stuff like that complain to you as soon as you push it to Git trees or whatever. We're going to start, we're going to start uh, monitoring people and policing you folks. So we're going to give you some ideas about things. One of the few things that real time does is it turns spin locks into mutexes. That makes the things much more preemptible. So a spin lock, don't expect it to be preemptible or, not, or turn preemption off. So if you, need a, if you need to basically make sure that this code here um, is not preempted, a spin lock is not going to guarantee that that will happen once you turn into the real time world. It will guarantee that you stay on that CPU. So it, it disables migration. So in the real time place, if you do a spin lock, your migration will be disabled. So you could guarantee that you'll still stay on that CPU, but it doesn't mean that something else can't come in and do something there. So you have to worry about that. Spin lock IRQ save does not, will not disable interrupts, but in the real time world, interrupts are threads. So a thread uh, interrupt could still come in there, so it still needs that spin lock. So a spin lock IRQ save, if you do a spin lock IRQ save and access uh, per CPU variables that the interrupt uh, shouldn't handle, and you're saying, well, I disabled interrupts, so this guy shouldn't care about it. Well, it can still get to it unless there's a spin lock protecting that section in the, in the interrupt handler. So spin lock IRQ save does not mean that it's going to prevent an interrupt from actually happening in that case in the real-time world. So you have to think about this. And by the way, threaded interrupts are in mainline kernel, so that's actually kind of true regardless, although, yeah, spin lock IRQ save does, disables preemption in mainline, so it still protects it. Um, 
priority inheritance is there. So sleeping locks, the sleeping locks will get the same priority inheritance that few Texas have today. So here's my, I love, I always have to throw this slide in. I think I threw this slide in back in 2007 when I gave my talk at the um, Ottawa Linux Symposium about understanding the real-time patch. And I just love this slide, so I have to reuse it in all my talks about real-time. Just so those, um, who here is uncomfortable about what priority inversion is? Uh, okay, you all, so, can I skip it? No, no, damn. So, normal case, you have priority inversion, I'll be quick then, you know. Uh, priority inheritance will inherit the task, so task C gets the uh, priority inheritance, and then the guy got. So, going back to this one, the old, I know I'm going to explain this, you guys already know this. Uh, a is the highest priority, B is second, C is third. If C runs, gets preempted, A runs, grabs a lock that C owns, so C runs again, it gets preempted by B, goes on forever, and A never runs, so B not only blocks C, but also prevents A from running. So priority inheritance means that, you know, once you give the lock up, if, or sorry, when A blocks on C, it, C will inherit the priority of A, so A runs. So when B wakes up, it can't interrupt or pre uh, preempt C, so then it could finish, and once it releases the lock, it loses its priority, so A gets to go, runs, finishes, sleeps, and B continues. Priority inheritance implementation is hard. Okay, it can be, get really complex. It's been through several iterations. Uh, it looks nothing like it was when we first introduced it way back in 2004. Uh, or three, maybe, perhaps. Um, and one of the things that you have to realize in the real-time kernel that we're going to do is um, read, reader, read writer locks, um, where you have multiple readers and a single writer. To do it, to keep the same paradigm as the Linux kernel, you'd, and you want to keep priority inheritance, you have to have multiple priority inheritance, which means this. If you have a bunch of readers running at low priority and a high priority process is running and grabs a writer lock and preempts, to get priority inversion from happening, because now it's blocked on every single reader until all those readers release their lock, the writer can't go. So multiple priority inheritance means that you have to update the priority of every single um, thread that, ha that that writer is waiting on. That gets complex. It gets actually exponentially more complex than the original uh, real t uh, priority inheritance code. So there's three things that we could do. Well, Thomas will say two things that we could do because Thomas hates the third one. Um, and I'm, I implemented it once, so I, but he always says I, I, I'm just crazy. Uh, first thing is serialize all readers. So we turn, in fact, actually that's what the real time, I think, I don't know if we switched it back yet. For the longest time, we're, we're discussing switching to two. But the first thing we do is we serialize all readers. So if you have a reader write a lock, they become, it becomes a mutex. So every reader will now serialize on every other reader. So if you have you know, a reader write a lock across 60 CPUs, and you have 60 readers go, they just went one, two, three, and they all have to wait for the one that has the reader. That could be a long latency there. That's, it causes slowdown. It causes performance problems. It causes a lot of bad things to happen. We would just love to get rid of reader writer locks. Use RCU or find some other way of doing it. Uh, because reader writer locks are horrible on the cache line for mainline kernels. So just because, like, oh, it's a bad for real time, no, it's also bad for uh, mainline because of the cache bouncing around. You could actually kill performance with reader writer locks as well. Um, so we like saying get rid of it, but if you have it. Uh, the second thing we're thinking of doing is saying screw it. Reader writer locks are not going to be converted to priority inheritance. If you use reader writer locks, good luck. Uh, if you, could, you could have priority inversion, and so be it. Third thing is to say, screw it, do it the complex way, my way. I've done this twice. Uh, I've implemented um, multi, multiple reader um, priority inheritance, and it actually works rather well, but Thomas hates it because ad the added complexity is at a higher level than the Linux kernel should actually have, something that you need something stable on. It's almost almost impossible to prove that it's correct. But it's there. It's fun. Um, now, like I said, preemption usually gets disabled by spin locks. In preempt RT, it doesn't. So if you have per CPU critical sections, you have to be careful that you use the, you know, um, spin lock IRQ save. So some places we have, you don't use spin locks. We, we have a lot of places that you just do preempt disable. 
And I've seen places where they do preempt disable and then they grab a spin lock or something, which will break RT. Because RT spin locks are mutexes and in, in um, the main Linux kernel, you can't do preempt disable and call a mutex. That breaks as well. So since spin locks are mutexes in real time, you can't do preempt disable and then call a spin lock. Uh, what we have instead is what we call a local lock. Because usually when you do preempt disable, you're doing it mainly to serialize some critical section. You have some data that's usually per CPU. And you know that the only way to protect it, instead of worrying about cache lines, because reader writer locks are horrible, so what you do is you, one thing you do instead is you create a um, per CPU uh, data. And this per CPU data is just protected by a preempt disable. Because once you preempt disable, and you don't have to worry about, say, if interrupts don't touch it, uh, no other thread can touch that data because it's per CPU. So that's a normal common way of doing, getting rid of reader writer locks. Like I said, reader writer locks are bad, preempt disable is good. Well, not for real time. So these, sometimes you get these huge sections of preempt disable, which means that when you have a huge section of preempt disable, that means the latency of waking up a task that needs to run right away has to wait for that preempt disable to finish. So that adds latency, so we don't want that. What we haven't said is a new feature that's going to come next at the mainline kernel, so coming this year, probably in a month or two, is local locks. Uh, local lock is a way of replacing both preempt disable and even IRQ disable. Uh, you say local lock, you give it a name, and in the uh, real time, or in the mainline kernel, that local lock is nothing more than preempt disable. Your code actually does not change. Or if you compile it, it's identical to what you have today. So come see, use local lock. Now why is this good for you? You don't care about preempt RT. You don't care about real time. You only care about your code, your mainline code. It annotates what you're protecting. This way, you could say, hey, a lot of times, have you, I don't know how many people have done this. I've done this a few times. Looking in the kernel, you see a preempt disable, local RQ, local RQ disable, and you say, why? How many people have done that? Few. Okay. There's a lot of times you'll go through and you'll see preempt disable, and you're like, why is this here? And there's this, all this code that goes on, and it's because something here and here are, re are related. Nothing tells you why. So you have to go through git logs, history, talk to the author who usually says to you, I forgot. <laughs> so local lock is actually a way to put a name there. And then you can actually say, this is protected by the local lock this. So now you actually know when you see local lock with a name on it, hey, this actually has a rationale. I know I could figure this in the future, even when I forgot why I wrote this code. I know why this preemption was disabled, but it's really a local lock that says, okay, this prevents you know, other things. Yes? It's a macro that will turn in, into a preempt disable. Actually, it could be a, yeah, I think it's a macro, or it could also be a uh, inline, uh, what's it called, static inline function. But it's going to be like a yeah, macro, and depending on the config option, it'll change. In real, in, on RT, what it will turn into, it'll be turning into actually a mutex with migration disabled. So you basically do a build and it takes a much higher. Yes. It's basically you can annotate what you're protecting. So that's the rationale of giving it to mainline, even though it helps RT greatly, it's going to help mainline as well. So the local blocks are a way of annotating blocks where that annotation, that name will be, yes. Yes, stay for the next presentation. Julia has some, yes. So stay, she's going to tell you a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about right now, but she'll get a lot more <laughs> detailed. Yes. So, well, I'll just follow you after this talk. Anyway, um, so the local locks are good for that, and it becomes a mutex or whatever, and it's also a per CPU mutex. So you don't have to worry about the cache line bouncing. So when you grab a local lock, it's only grabbing a lock for that CPU. So if it, if you schedule out, migration's disabled, you're always going to stay on that CPU. But if something schedules in and goes into that same critical path, they're going to block on that local lock until the other guy comes back and it has priority inheritance and all the wonderful stuff to get everything moving flowing, just like a normal spin lock. But you don't have to worry about that. That's, we take care of all the details, just protect your sections with these local locks. Interrupts are the same way. Now interrupts are a little bit more. We have, a lot of times you'll have per CPU data, that can be accessed by interrupts. Now, in mainline, local IRQ save is good enough to do this. Because when an interrupt goes off, you're going to have the same thing. You have the interrupt that goes into the, that may access this per CPU data, and you have to stop the interrupt from happening. So preemption disable is not enough 
because preemption will only keep other tasks from coming in. It doesn't stop interrupts. So local IRQ save. So what we got now is instead of using local IRQ save, you use local lock IRQ save. And you annotate it. And then the interrupt itself will have to say it will only do local lock IRQ. Remember, that's only, it'll make preempt disable in mainline, but it doesn't matter. Preempt disable and interrupt is kind of a no-op. So you, this you still mark it, and then you could say what it is. Uh, another thing that we have, too, is we're going, I don't know if we're going to try to get rid of this. I don't know if we're going to keep it, but if you're ever doing anything stable RTs, you got to look at this. We have something called local RQ disable underscore no RT, which basically says if you don't have RT configured, it's local RQ disable. If you do have RT configured, it's a no op. Um, but those are ugly. I think we're trying to get, we're, we're afraid of adding those. We're, they're, they're just kind of ugly. So eventually you go and you do a merge and you do a git merge uh, for your stable tree and you get a conflict. You go, oh crap, I actually have to think. Because a lot of times stable releases, if you do a git merge and everything goes fine, there's no thinking, it's really just monkey work. You just, okay, git merge, just boom, boom, mostly scripts, just get there, yeah, yeah, do this. You just read Facebook while your you know, automated process is going on and when it's done, like, okay, you commit and do everything. But then if you do a git merge, <laughs> You say, oh crap, I actually have to think now. Conflicts are actually good because there's a lot of times, I've, or not a lot of times, there's a few times that a merge happened where it didn't conflict and that actually, but it had a bug in there. I'll talk about that later. So let's say you're dealing with conflicts. I do a git merge of uh, 4935 gives me boom, 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 and says, oh, crap. I do a git diff, and I see all this. For those with bad eyes, a little zoom in. And <clears throat> you see that, oh, there's this head, which is, remember, the head is the RT branch. So head, I have this uh, CQ free current first. Below that is uh, resched fresh, blah, blah, blah. And this is kind of a trivial one. Like I said, this is an easy one. I can actually can tell right from here how easy it is because I can see that I changed, it looks like I probably changed the SIG Q free from into the main line. And below, down below, you'll see this disappearing one on once task something here. So the way, I, the way I handle this, I'm not sure if Julia does this, but the first thing I do is I, look, I do, okay, you get diff 4934, the vanilla kernel, with my kernel that I was started at before I got the conflict. I want to see what did I change? What was exactly the change that the real-time kernel performed? And sure enough, looking at this, yes, it renamed the SIGQ free to the SIGQ free current first. So we, there's a reason we did that. Okay, simple. Down below, there was a warn on once, and okay, it was, we added one. So then I go and say, okay, let's see what happened with 4935. Uh, so I diff the exact same source, you know, 4934, to see what 4935 did, and let's look at what it did. Okay, yeah, I yeah, did some stuff in the top, and then, okay, I added uh, this little resched timer just above this, no big deal, not too hard. Down below, it added a little red sked timer equals false, okay, so there's a little conflict there, it's pretty easy. So, you know, finally, this is the final result. Yeah, I do the rename, add this, do some changes. Easy conflict resolution. A little more non-trivial. And this actually goes back to the bug I think uh, happened before. So I did this, you know, you go up to 4961, get diff, I see, wake up all locked, wake up all. Okay, it moved. So I do the same thing, diff the RT code against the uh, stable release that it was again, based against. Okay, I renamed wake up all locked or wake up all to wake up all locked. Good. Then I go and look at what the upstream kernel did compared to the same baseline, and it moved the wake up all outside the raw clock. So, obvious answer, right? Well, you know it's the obvious answer, so you know it's wrong. Why? Come on, it's a pretty easy one. Genau. <laughs> exactly. German friends left. No, the, uh, yes, it's no longer locked, 
Wake Up All Locked is in main, it's also in mainline, but it's also nice in RT. And because it's okay, it's a Wake Up Queue. The Wake Up Queue has its own lock. It's a sleeping lock. Mainline uses this for optimization because if you could say, hey, I have a lock that protects a work queue, why do I go and use the work queue lock as well? Well, here's the thing. If you go back and look at what it did, you notice that there's a raw spin lock there. Now, a raw spin lock does not get converted into a mutex. It stays a spin lock, just like it is in mainline. It disables preemption. It's a spinner. It doesn't sleep. Well, wake up all has a queue, or wake up has, a wake up all has a queue lock that's a spin lock. Well, what do we know about spin locks? They turn into mutexes. Grabbing a raw lock and then a mutex and then a releasing a raw lock is bad. Bad in mainline, bad in RT. So we had to convert it to a wake up all lock because what wake up all locked is telling the kernel, hey, I have this work, uh, I have this queue, wake queue, that I have my own protection. Don't waste the energy of grabbing another lock to do it. So we prevent the lock. But you're right. So the correct, <clears throat> um, well, yeah, here's where I talked about uh, the spin locks. So if all I did was just move it out, it would be wrong because the lock is now pr not protected at all. So when I just move it, I actually keep the exact same change that the upstream did, just move it out. So this actually, this actually removes one of the patches from the real-time kernel. By adding this in, the real-time kernel doesn't need to modify it. So <clears throat> dealing with no conflicts. Like I said, sometimes things are very subtle. And this is actually a little bit of a misnomer because my slide shows a conflict. And thank God there was a conflict on this idea because if there wasn't a conflict, if the original code went in first before another code went in, we would never have solved the, the breakage. And it would have just merged completely nicely and we would never have known an issue happened. And luckily, the code that got brought back had a pre-code brought back that the real-time patch. The reason why I bring this one up is on 4.9, this was fine. On 4.18, we backported this patch and they didn't do the update because there was no conflict. Um, <clears throat> the conflict here is this. So if I go through and did a git diff 4.9.65 to 66, I see what it did. It moved uh, this little block of have RT push IPI and I wrote the code for this so I knew exact, so even it, on 3.18, I knew the problem was going to be there. So it moved it down here. If I look at what did the real-time kernel do, it added that one line. That one line is very important because in the real-time kernel, the spin, um, the IRQ work it doesn't actually happen in IRQ. Well, it does because IRQ handlers are now threaded. So IRQ works are now threaded. Well, the scheduler has its own IRQ work that would be kind of destroying the point of using the IRQ work if it required scheduling. So this is the way that does the uh, real-time task push and pull logic uh, uses IRQ work in the kernel. So if the scheduler, uh, so if the scheduler calls IRQ work that gets scheduled out, the real-time tasks aren't going to merge in until that IRQ work, which is not a real-time task, gets scheduled in to say, oh, this real-time task can be moved over here. Kind of kills everything. But no one would know that unless you actually knew the code. So sometimes you've got to actually look at some of the code or look at mainline upstream and say, okay, what did they do to make sure it works in that point? So this, like I said, this is one of the hard things that are very, you have to be very careful about. And this is where I kind of explain what it is. So next is backporting RT patches. Stable is the easy part. Like I said, that's a lot, of, especially if there's no conflicts, it really is mundane. You just go through, run through a bunch of tests. You get a lot of Facebook reading in at the time. Or Google Plus for some of you. So when a new RT patch or uh, document comes, or when new development comes out, the, um, we look for stable RT tags. If a stable RT tag is in there, Sebastian will say, when Sebastian's writing code and he does a commit, there's certain things that he says, okay, this is broken in past kernel releases. He'll put, just like in mainline, when you CC stable uh, at 
vigor.kernel.org. The real-time code has the same idea of doing stable RT at vigor.kernel.org, and we will scan for these, and any of these we will pull in. And that's very, um, <clears throat> that's useful. But I also found out that he, there's a lot of patches that should go be backported that you know, Sebastian doesn't really think is important. But when I look at it, and I know kind of my use, use cases, I'm like, no, I think that is important. So a lot of times, a lot of changes in upstream in the backport patches, we backport almost a lot, a lot of patches, and some things we just don't backport. It matters how much of a change of it. Is it a big impact? We, not, we may not backport it. Sometimes we add new features to the real-time patch, not so much anymore because we're getting ready to push it to mainline, but a lot of times we add new features to the real-time patch, those never get backported. So how do we synchronize among all our ports. So we right now, like I said, we have 494441 and 318 that are right now dealing with uh, backports. So we're working on using Google Docs. So we write down all the, uh, um, <clears throat> any one of us uh, the, of the uh, stable maintainers can add to this saying, hey, here's the um, commit name. Here's the upstream commit ID that's in Sebastian's tree that has okay. And then I'm going to say, I applied it um, and I'm going to, and then other people, we could all go and look at this and say, hey, so-and-so pulled this patch in, maybe I should look at it too. And then if it's not applicable, because sometimes it only affects like some, like uh, the one that said, you see the NAs there, that was uh, one of the patches was only applicable for 4.4, didn't affect 4.1 or beyond, so the other two doesn't matter. So this is a way we synchronize among us, ourselves to use this. Um, still have updated 4.1. <laughs> What's wrong with it? It doesn't, it seems to work. And it's not many. It's not really, because a lot, like this shows you that there's really that much more work going on with the upstream kernel. We're right now working about getting it ready to go into mainline. So right now the focus is that. So we're actually having less and less issues with mainline kernel. So it's getting really close. So what do we do to backport it? Usually what I do is I always save a branch uh, from what was the last time I backported. So say, 414, uh, 15, RT13 was the last time I did a backport from Sebastian's branch. Now he's up to 24, RT19, and I'm like, okay, let me go see what he's changed and see if I want to backport anything. So what I do is I, first thing I do is, I, I kind of left a step out here, is I go to my tree, my, my stable tree, say it's 49 RT, I will branch, I will make a copy of it, like a temp branch copy of it, then I merge, um, Oh wait, sorry, let me go back. I don't start with my tree I'm working on, 4.9. I actually take the tree that I last backported, the 4.14.15 RT13. I pull that, this is the last time I actually backported patches from Sebastian. I make that into a temp tree. Then I merge 4.14.24 into that tree. So, because that matches the stable release that he based his stuff on because I don't care about anything that he pulled from stable. I only care about what he changed. So to have a proper comparison, I need to start, make my tree equivalent to his stable to see his differences. So what I do is I go and I start with my 414, RT, or 414, 15, RT, 13, make it into, pull into a branch, pull in 414, 24. It has a bunch of conf conflicts. You know what? I don't care. I save them all as is, or I go in and delete them. I don't care about the result. I only care about commits. As long as it goes up there, I just want to know what's the difference that he has. So I don't have to actually even spend any brain power fixing the commits, those. It, they're they, they're uh, irrelevant. And then, uh, how many people here know about Git Cherry? Okay, how many people, the rest of the people don't know about Git Cherry? Okay, so. What Git Cherry, uh, Daniel now knows, which he, he's like, darn it, I wish I knew about that a long time ago, because he actually almost rewrote Git Cherry. Uh, Git Cherry, I've used for a long time. It's an awesome utility. So here, Git Cherry will take the branch. So right now, remember I said, I'm at, technically, I'm at, let me go back, oops, ah, oh, jeez. So I'm at 414, well actually I'm at 414.24 RT13, technically, because I merged 24 there. So I'm at 414.24 RT13, I do a git cherry of head. This shows me all the commits that are in the RT19 that are not in RT13. It shows me, boom. And you'll see 
there's uh, the 18, 19, 20, blah, 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 or whatever I was at. So, or 14, 15, see, you'll see all the commits that's added. I only care, about, I don't care about his version commits. I only care about what he added. So I take these out, and then this is what I use to build a quilt queue. And I will now look at each individual patch and examine it myself. So this is more of a manual work of saying, if it has a stable RT on it, I pull it. It's going to be part of the things I pull in. If it doesn't, I look at it and say, should I pull it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes I try, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, so wait, so wait, you're saying that if we have a conflict when we pull in, yeah, we tag it. Yeah. Well, we should, well, I always did, Julia will from now on, <laughs> so, yes. So, well, like I said, no, I do, I, I mentioned it, and you might have missed it, I said that when I have a conflict, well, I usually pull, 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 and I tag each one, but now I really only have to tag the one that has a conflict on it. So I pull one in, have a conflict on it, I fix the conflict, I'll build and boot the kernel, run a few tests, just, I basically spend maybe, uh, after the thing's built, maybe 15 minutes on it. It's smoke tested. And then I go on until I hit, I catch up to the mainline, um, the stable, and that's when I run my full stream. If I screwed up, usually a lot of times if I screwed up that conflict one, the full run will actually find a bug. And then I go back to, yeah, if I hit a bug, I say, wait a minute, I fix it back, and now I might actually revert all the way back to that first one and say, did this, and then run the full test suite on that first one. I've only had to do that once. Anyone else? Wait, why? Okay, so wait, you revert everything, pull everything in. I'm wait, wait, you, you. Yeah, the merge conflicts will still be there. Oh, wait, wait, you get, you get, a you pull from my stable tree or from? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So wait, well, you're trying to, but you, why not revert, or you, you can't do reverts, or I mean, you can't do um, rebases on your tree or something? Okay, so basically, okay, oh, I, so, so let, me, let me ask you this. Okay, so uh, this will be recording, no one knows what you're saying. So it's just like me talking on the phone. Uh, <coughs> So anyway, basically I think what you're saying is you have, um, uh, you use the stable tree, you're pushing off to other people, maybe adding your own stuff or something to it, and then, and then you're, but, but, you, but other people rely on your work. So ideally what you're doing is you're reverting everything out and you're coming back and pulling it. So once you have the con uh, conflict to get the mainline stable. What happens, have you tried instead of reverting, trying to do a pull from the mainline, uh, the real-time stable right there? Because it might actually fix everything for you. So instead of pulling back to the stable, just pull from the next RT or stable, and it will actually have the updates that fix that fixes the conflicts for you. Okay. Well, okay. If it works for you. No, I mean, like I said, it's it's uh, right now. I can say if it works for you, <laughs> it's, yeah. do it. Yeah, yep, right, right. Um, anything else? Okay, well, thanks again. <laughs>